I love Highland Presbyterian Church. There is something special about this place. I can feel it in the building when you walk into this gorgeous facility. I can feel it in the people. I can feel it in the choir. I heard them practicing this morning. And wait till you hear the anthem today. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being high and 1 being low, this anthem is 106, I'm telling you. It's (laughs) fabulous. I love that your pastor, Roger, and, and Noe, and Anne, your pastoral staff is wonderful. And I also will just want to say, you know, we've all been shaped by the people who have shaped our lives. And there's a woman here today in the front, Peg Horner, uh, Eric's mother, and she and her husband, George, and the people of First Presbyterian Church of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, shaped my life when I was a young 24-year-old pastor. So, Peg, it's great to see you again, and thank you for shaping my life. And also, Jim Weaver, I see hiding back there, about six pews back. And when I was a new pastor in New Providence, New Jersey, Jim was the pastor in Pluckerman, and he kind of was one of my mentors. He doesn't realize how much he taught me, and I learned from you, and thank you, Jim, for all you've done for me for many years. It's an honor for me to be here today, and our scripture reading is from Philippians chapter 3, verse 4 and following. This passage talks about our past, the Apostle Paul's past, but also what shaped his identity as a person and as a Christian. Listen for the word of God. The Apostle Paul says, even though I too have confidence in the flesh, if anyone has confidence to be confident, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, I was blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I've come to regard as loss because of Jesus Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And being found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death so that somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now, not that I've already obtained this, nor have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Dear friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, pour through me the gift of preaching today, that these words might not be human words or a human opinion, but by your grace, these words might become your living word to us. And I pray they would touch every person, every person at their point of need. To that end, O God, bless and anoint this message, and we know you will, for we pray with anticipation in the strong name of Jesus, the risen and the reigning Christ. And may all God's people say, amen. Picture the scene with me in your mind's eye. Harold Lamb describes it in his brilliant book, The Life of Alexander the Great. Lamb tells the story of the day the Greek army was marching across Asia Minor, and they were conquering every foe in sight. And then came the day that they came out of a rainforest and they were confronted with a mountain range. They'd never seen this mountain range before. They scurried back to their crude Greek maps to get the dimensions of the mountain range and the name of the mountain range and all that. And to their horror, they had marched clean off their map. And for the first time in their life, they met a obstacle, a foe, an enemy that made them afraid. Do you know what the name of the enemy was? The unknown. This is when we see why the words the great were ascribed to Alexander's name. Because in that moment, Alexander the Great called his army together and he said, men, 
Every army is always tempted to stay within the neat confines of the known. It is easier that way. But a great army will always march off the map because there's always new worlds to conquer. Now, every one of us at Highland Presbyterian Church this morning is marching off the map. We've either been marching off the map in the past, in the recent past, or we're marching off the map right now, or we're about to march off the map in the future. Because if you think about it, every year of our lives, we are marching off the map as we face new challenges. I'm thinking of a young couple who came to me for their fourth and final premarital counseling session on a Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. The wedding was in two weeks, and they were such a great young couple. They were so in love. Everything was wonderful and idyllic. It was a great time in their life. They'd met each other, fallen completely in love. But this day when they walked into my office, I knew something <clears throat> wasn't quite right. The, the, the groom-to-be had his teeth clenched, and his face was very flushed and red as if he'd been yelling and fighting. And the, the bride-to-be's mascara was running all down her face, and I could tell she had been crying, and her eyes were moist. And... And then the story tumbled out that the groom-to-be thought the bride-to-be's mother was a little too involved in the wedding planning. <laughs> I thought, boy, this guy's got a lot to learn. <laughs> but then the young groom-to-be, in all seriousness, he leaned forward on the couch and he said, Tom, I know we're fighting today, but don't worry, in two weeks we'll be married and all our problems will be over. I said, Buster, your problems are just beginning. <laughs> but he didn't know any better. He was marching off the map. He'd never been married before. You know, when you get married, you're marching off the map. If you have children, you're marching off the map. You have a second child, and you're marching off the map. A third child, you're marching off the map. Then you hit the ripe old age of 30 or 40, and you're marching off the map. Then you get your dream job, and you're marching off the map. Or you lose a dream job, and you're marching off the map. And then you have grandchildren, and you're marching off the map. And you hit the ripe old age of 50 or 60 or 70, and you're marching off the map. You hit the age of 80 or 90 or 100, and you're marching off the map. There was a man in our Meals on Heels program in New York City we delivered Meals on Heels to older people, and this one man had turned 100 named Tonyo. We went over and celebrated his 100th birthday. We had champagne, and we had German chocolate cake. He was from Germany, and we celebrated his 100th birthday. I said, Tonyo, what's it like to be 100? He said, oh, Tom, it is so wonderful. I said, what's so wonderful about it? He said, well, think about the things I don't have to worry about anymore, like peer pressure, for example. But could we be honest enough in the joy of this fellowship here at Highland to say that sometimes the challenges we face when we march off the map are the size of the Himalaya mountains. If you've got a spouse who's been diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's, you are marching off the map. You know what I mean. If the C word has come into your life or the life of your family, cancer, and it's your spouse or your sibling or your child or your grandchild, you are marching off the map. If you have a child or a family member or a dear friend who's suffering from substance abuse or depression, you are marching off the map. And I hate to say it, but when your spouse dies, you've been married for 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 years, some of you have, and, and you lean over in the middle of the night and you reach out for that person who was always there and they died and they're not there anymore. If you've had that experience or are in the midst of that experience now, you are marching off the map. And when your sibling dies, you're marching off the map. And if a child dies or a grandchild dies, you are marching off the map. Well, what do we do when we march off the map? Paul Ricoeur, the great philosopher and expert on religion, talks about the extreme value of a limit experience. Recur says that when we have a limit experience, we hit the wall. We can't go any further humanly. And Recur says in that moment, that's when people run away from God or they don't believe in God anymore or they leave the church. But Recur says if you can stick with God in those tough times of life when you're marching off the map, if you can, if you can stick with God when you hit the wall and there's a limit experience and humanly you can't go any further, that's when you meet the risen, living Lord Jesus Christ. 
is in that moment when you can't go any further humanly and you experience God's power flowing through you. And McCurr says, a crisis is an invitation to a deeper walk with God. I wish I could take a walk. Your grounds of your church are so beautiful, and this narthex is so gorgeous, and I love the light, open, bright space, but I'd love to actually take a walk with every one of you today or have a cup of coffee with you out at one of those tables, and I'd love to ask you, where are you in your life right now? Where are you marching off the map? I'd love to ask you what's going on in your life right now where you're marching off the map into some unknown territory where you've never been before. I'd also love to ask you where our society is marching off the map For our society, our nation, our world is changing. Thomas Friedman, who wrote the book, The World is Flat, has written a new book. It's a brilliant new book called Thank You for Being Late. I'd commend it to you. But in that book, Friedman talks about the the three big changes in our world right now, technology, globalization, and climate change. And we are seeing the effects of all of those things, good and bad, right now. All these things are coming together. And he says these three things are coming together and our world is different. Our world's never going to be the same again, Friedman said. Everything is moving so fast and we're changing so fast that we can't keep up with it anymore. Even though we're plugged into the internet, we cannot possibly keep up with that. We are marching off the map. As we march off the map as individuals and as a society, as a nation... The Apostle Paul gives us in Philippians chapter 3, 4 and following, he gives us distilled wisdom. He gives us two admonitions. And if you will remember these admonitions, write them on the screensaver of your mind. They will help you as together we march off the map. Paul's first admonition is very simple, and his second admonition is very simple. The first admonition is forget what lies behind. Now, Paul is not saying the past is bad. He's not saying that the past didn't influence him. In fact, he's saying that the past helped to shape him. He studied under the feet of Gamaliel, the greatest of all the Jewish Pharisees, the greatest rabbi in Israel. He studied under Gamaliel. And the apostle Paul, he was Saul, you remember, who became Paul. He had studied at Gamaliel, and because of that mind he had and the, and the mindset that he got in the schools in Tarsus where he was raised, he was of the tribe of Benjamin, that elite tribe of the, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Because of all that background, he was able to write the two greatest theological books ever written, Galatians and Romans. They shaped John Calvin and Martin Luther, We're going to be celebrating 500 years of Protestantism at the end of next month. And they shaped Karl Barth, Galatians and Romans too. They're probably the two greatest books ever written. Paul could never have done that had it not been for his past. He knew that. And yet he says, my identity, as great as it was, didn't come from my past. There were a lot of problems in my past. He was, had such zeal for Judaism that he persecuted and killed Christians like Stephen. He helped the stone Stephen. But what he's saying is, my identity doesn't come from who I was. My identity doesn't come from what shaped me in the past, even though it was very valuable in many ways. It doesn't define me. He says what defines him is a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, reminding him he's a child of God. And no matter what happens in his life, what changes come in his life, he says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection so I might be like Christ. His identity came from knowing Jesus Christ. For Paul knew the subtle, sinister temptations to be idealized the past or be immobilized by the past. He knew the subtle temptations of idealizing the past because he'd studied the people of Israel and remembered when they were in the wilderness, they looked back to Egypt. Do you remember this? They looked back to Egypt and they said, would that we were back in Egypt. They were in captivity in Egypt, but they forgot about that. They they looked back to Egypt and they said, oh, we had all this to eat. And they looked back to Egypt and they idealized it and they made it better than it really was. Anybody ever look back on your past and you've idealized it? You've made it better than it really was. Years ago, I was invited back to First Presbyterian Church of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where, where Eric Horner and his mother, Peg, and his father, George, where I met them. Keith Brown, the senior pastor, called on behalf of the elders, and he said that the elders wanted me to come back for a very special anniversary and to preach the sermon at First Presbyterian Church of Bethlehem. And I said to Keith, well, he was the senior minister, I said, Keith, what do you think I should do? Do you really think I should come back? And he said, Tom, if I were you, I would not come back to this church. I said, Keith, why is that? He said, Tom, I hate to be the one to break it to you, 
but you're not nearly as good as they remember you were. I never cared for Keith Brown. I just didn't like the guy. But you know, isn't that the truth? That we often make the past in our mind better than it really was. Paul says, be very careful. Forget what lies behind. It shaped you, but don't idealize it. And also, don't be immobilized by it. Saul, Paul, could have been immobilized by the stoning of Stephen. That could have filled him with such guilt he would never have moved on. And unless I miss my guess, there's somebody here today who either said something they wish they hadn't said in the past or did something they wish they hadn't done, and they're immobilized by it. I have a sense somebody in this sanctuary is immobilized by something in the past, a relationship that isn't quite right, maybe. See, Saul knew, Paul knew that he had to get beyond the past. That's what he means when he says, forget what lies behind. The past shaped you, celebrate it, thank God for the good things in it, but don't live in the past. Your identity doesn't come from the past. Your identity comes from Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And the second bit of advice Forget what lies behind. And then the second bit of advice is strain forward to what lies ahead. And the word he uses for strain forward is the word for an athlete straining forward toward the tape. Have you ever seen an Olympic runner straining forward for the finish line? That's the sense in which you were straining forward to what lies ahead. It would be like Antonio Brown of the six-time Super Bowl champion Pittsburgh Steelers. I had to get that in somewhere. Brown would catch a pass from Ben Roethlisberger and strain forward with the ball for the end zone. That's the way we should strain forward to what lies ahead. We forget what lies behind. The past shaped us, but we strain forward for the new thing that lies ahead because that is our future. That's what God wants. And when you think of all that Jesus Christ did for us, giving us pardon for the past, power for the present, promise for the future, we can't rest on our laurels. We, we can't rest on who we were, what we did in the past. We've got to strain forward for the new thing God has in store for us. Now, you hear a lot now about the decline of the mainline church, and it, it is serious. The mainline Protestantism is in decline, even though we're celebrating our 500th anniversary. But I think this is a fabulous time to be the church. I think it's one of the greatest times in human history to be the church. We've got a phenomenal opportunity today. And the opportunity actually lies in our young people. And I was telling the group last night and yesterday that, that it used to be when we were growing up, you and I growing up as, as people, we would believe first, then we'd join the church, then we would be, be baptized, have our, have our, go out and serve. So we believe in Christ, join the church, then we'd serve. Today, it's just the opposite. The young people want to serve first, then they want to join the church, may or may not join the church, but their belief system grows out of their service. We've got to serve first. And young people and older people need to come together in service. I learned this at Fifth Avenue Church in New York City. When I was first called there as pastor, I went to see a wise man named Lenten Gunn in Harlem. And Lenton Gunn was an African-American, uh, older pastor, been pastor there for 30 years. He was very, very filled with distilled wisdom. I said, Lenton, I want to get Fifth Avenue involved in the city of New York. What should I do? He said, well, don't pick one issue and then do it for a year or two and then change your issues. Find an issue and get involved in it for a decade. And then when you've done it for a decade, you get involved for two decades and three decades. I said, how do you know what you're supposed to get involved in? He said, and I'll never forget this. It will come to your door. So I went back and told our elders, the, the issue that we're supposed to get involved in at Fifth Avenue will come to our door. One of our elders said, you know, tonight coming into the session meeting, I saw homeless people sleeping on our steps. Do you think that's what Lenten means by it'll come to our door? Maybe we should get to know the homeless, have a ministry to the homeless. The more we talked about it, the elder said, Tom, what if you would invite Lenten Gunn down here to preach sometime and lead a seminar for us? And meanwhile, you would go up to Harlem and preach in his church and maybe lead a seminar for them. Maybe we could start to become partner churches. So I called Lenten Gunn, thinking this was a great idea. I said, Lenten, Tom Toole from Fifth Avenue Church, I'm wondering if you could come down to Fifth Avenue. We'd love to have you preach and lead a seminar. And, and if you're willing, I'd like to fill your pulpit while you're down here and maybe I could do a seminar for your people we could trade pulpits and be partners what do you say Lenten and there was silence on the other end of the phone 
And I thought, oh no, I have offended him. What did I say that was wrong? And after what seemed like an eternity, Linton Gunn said, I don't preach anywhere without my choir. And I said, well, what I mean is you and your choir would come down here to <laughs> Fifth Avenue, and me and my choir, we'd come up to Harlem. He said, brother, you got yourself a deal. So Lenton Gunn came down with his choir of about 40 African-American voices with drums and tim timpani and, and guitars, and it was unbelievable. And, and when Lenton would preach at Fifth Avenue, the choir would go, amen, hallelujah, praise God, praise Jesus. And Lenton got so fired up that he preached for over an hour. They're still recovering from it on Fifth Avenue. But, <laughs> but anyway, he preached for an hour, and they were rocking, and they were rolling, and the choir was swaying, and they were rocking and rolling, and it was amazing. Meanwhile, I'm up in Harlem, and you know, I hate to say it to this choir who's so gifted and talented, but our choir at Fifth Avenue was like the Frozen Chosen. When they swayed, it was just about an inch, you know. That was about, that was about the best they could do. You know, they're not like this choir. They swayed about an inch. Anyway, but anyway, the, because the congregation was giving me a lot of amens and hallelujahs, I started to preach, and I preached for almost an hour myself and got fired up in it. But I did find out when you preach in an African-American church and you're in trouble in the middle of the sermon, they cry out right in the middle of the sermon, help him, Jesus, help him, Jesus. <laughs> So I was getting fired up and preaching for a long time. At the end of the sermon, they all burst into applause. And so I went back to the microphone and I said, boy, if I'd known this, I'd have come to, up here to St. James in Harlem years ago. And they applauded again. I said, I love this church so much. I'd like to be on your staff. They applauded again. I said, maybe I could be the youth pastor. And everybody stood and applauded except one guy right here in the front row. And he's going, no, 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 no. I said, what's the matter? Don't you want me to come? He said, no, I'm the youth pastor. Out of all this hilarity, a partnership formed. And our church got involved with St. James in Harlem, and we started to have a homeless ministry. We housed people to sleep on our steps every night. We built a homeless sh shelter in our building where the homeless showered, and they, they shaved, and they, they slept, and they dined. And we had this ministry to the homeless people. It was magnificent. We helped 70 people a year get out of homelessness and into an apartment or a home of their own. It was a life-changing ministry, but here's the key to it. The key was service. I would announce from the pulpit that we needed people to wake up the homeless and care for them, and we needed people to stay downstairs with the homeless as hosts. And people from our congregation started to volunteer, and the word spread in the underground network, and all these young adults, even people who were not members of our church, even young adults who didn't believe in Jesus Christ, they started to come for the service. They liked getting involved with the homeless, and they started, thought it was cool to get involved in that. And when I'd go up to Harlem up there, they, went, they thought it was cool to go up to Harlem, and they'd go up to Harlem with me. These were young adults between the ages of 18 and 26, there were, there were hundreds of them coming and getting involved in our ministry. And then we would pair them with older people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and one woman in her 90s. And we'd pair them, and they would minister to the homeless together. And they'd learn from each other about homeless ministry. And it was spectacular. And out of this, many, many young people came to faith in Jesus Christ. In fact, one Sunday, I baptized so many people, so many young adults. I said, I should have a hose. I felt like a Baptist preacher. But see, out of all that service came professions of faith. The greatest opportunities of our life, Charles Swindoll says, come to us brilliantly disguised as seemingly insoluble problems. Let that lean against you a little bit. We think the decline of the church, because these young people are spiritual but not religious, we think it's a major problem. Actually, it's an opportunity to listen to our culture, to listen to them, it's a great opportunity to get them involved in service paired with older people. And I can hear some of you saying, I'm too old to serve. Nobody in God's kingdom is too old or too young to serve. Remember, Benjamin Franklin was 79 when he invented the bifocal. Edison was 83 when he made pioneering discoveries in rubber. Michelangelo was 85 when he finished the Sistine Chapel. And Pablo Casals was 93 years old, 93 years old, and he was still the greatest cellist in the world and practiced four hours a day. A reporter said, Pablo, with all respect, you're the greatest cellist in the world. You're 93 years old. Why are you still practicing four hours a day? Casals said, because I think I'm making some progress. 
Are you making any progress in your walk with Christ? If we develop service opportunities with young people, we can change the world for Jesus Christ because we'll be marching off the map together. I close with a thought that years ago in Atlanta, Georgia, Andrew Young was the, was the mayor, and he took his daughter to see Millard Fuller, the president of Habitat for Humanity, preach and speak. Millard Fuller was an inspiring preacher, and he gave a sermon about all these young people in that audience that night going with him over to Uganda, and he needed other people to fund the ministry. He said, we're going to go to Uganda. We're going to, we're going to put a house over every person's head in Uganda. Now, Uganda had civil strife and, and ethnic cleansing, and it was a very violent place to be. And, and Andrew Young's daughter leaned over to him, and she was a college student. She said, Daddy, I really want to go. And he said, okay, you're needed right here in Atlanta, Georgia. Don't just listen to Dr. Fuller. And she said, Daddy, I really want to go with Dr. Fuller. And he said, no, 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 you're needed right here in college, and you're needed in Atlanta. Let other people go. I'll write a big check to Dr. Fuller. But let's listen to the end of his sermon. The sermon ended, and everybody applauded. And, and then Andrew Young's daughter said, Daddy, I really want to go. He said, honey, you're needed right here in Atlanta. George, you're going to finish school. She said, Daddy, I thought that you preach sometimes about taking risks, putting your life on the line for Jesus Christ. I thought you preached about that. He said, well, honey, I was just preaching. I didn't mean you, you know. But then he said, okay, graduate from college, and if you graduate from college and still want to go, your mother and I will let you go. She graduated, and she said, Mommy and Daddy, I still want to go. And you know, you can't hold on to these kids forever. They're marching off the map, and when they march off the map, you march off the map with them. All of us as parents and grandparents know what that's all about, and they let her go. They took her to Hartsfield Airport, gave her a hug and kiss, and as Andrew Young hugged his daughter, his wife noticed that there were big tears streaming down his face. They waved goodbye to her. She went through security, and they were about to turn to get in the car to go home. And Andrew's wife said, honey, this is really hard for you, isn't it? He said, oh, you mean letting her go? Oh, it's very hard. But that's not why I'm crying. She said, well, then why are you crying? He said, oh, I just got in touch with the fact that we raised our daughter to be a respectable Christian. I, at least, wasn't prepared for her to become a real one. Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, the state of Pennsylvania, this wonderful commonwealth, the northeast of the United States, America and our world is desperate. Young people are desperate to see real, authentic, alive Christians who will put their faith on the line for Jesus Christ with passion and devotion and deep commitment. And I tell you the truth, we don't know. Not a one of us here knows what the future holds. We're marching off the map. Not a one of us knows what the future holds, but we do know who holds the future, and his name is Jesus Christ. And he's going to hold on to all of us as together we march off the map to the glory of God.